As we, uh, as we come together this evening, we want to welcome all of our friends on YouTube. Uh, as I've said for a month now, uh, if you are in need of a copy of this diagram, please send us an email, leave us a comment in the YouTube, uh, whatever comment section, whatever it's called. Send us a tweet, whatever it is. Go to our website. Uh, we want to put this in your hands digitally. Uh, if you're in need of a copy of it, please let us know. We'll get it to you. But we have a, a handful of visual diagrams that we have used over the past couple of months that I hope are helpful to you. And so I want to I wanna kind of give us a, a brief catch-up of where we went from last week. Uh, and so I want us to really think through our six-word or six-phrase testimony uh, that, we, that we began the process of last Wednesday evening. But before we get there, some of you love it, some of you hate it. I want to review our beloved little arrow. And I see, I got this cool little tripod this week, and I think it'll work. Of course, it, it never works until it works. So here we go. I got my little tripod up here. There we go. Um, this little arrow begins with two people, or one person. It could be whoever we want it to be. But obviously, it takes a human being to be a part of this effort. So uh, let's call them Jeff and Jennifer. She has longer hair. Some of you are continually pleased with my artistic ability. Jeff and Jennifer are arbitrary names, but I use those names because they have J's and F's. What is the significance of J and F? Can anybody give me the, give me the answer? What does JF stand for? Jesus follower. Thank you. Jeff and Jennifer are Jesus followers. And that's important in this conversation because we know that these principles are not just reserved for the professional Christians. They're not just reserved for Sunday school teachers or deacons. They're not just reserved for pastors. Anybody that claims to be a follower of Jesus should be living out this lifestyle of discipleship. And so the, these, these are biblical principles that are true for anybody that claims to be a follower of Jesus. So if you're in the pew tonight and you claim to be a follower of Jesus... I want you to think in the back of your mind, how well are we doing these things? How well are we doing these things individually? How well are we doing these things as a church corporately? Uh, I assure you we've got lots of room for improvement across our church corporately. Uh, but maybe you have lots of room for improvement in your life individually too. So, Jeff and Jennifer are abiding in Christ. That's the first A of the ASAP. I'm going to put the ASAP down at the bottom in a different color. So, the first step is to abide in Christ. We talked about uh, John chapter 15 and the principle of abiding in Christ and leaning into our relationship with Him, a relationship of dependence. Um, and if you've got the printed sheet with the ASAP stuff, if you've got the printed sheet that looks like this, uh, under every one of these headings, there is at least one passage of Scripture. Um, yes, mission has one passage of Scripture. Uh, there are lots of other parts of this that have gobs of passages of Scripture. But the abiding piece is really rooted in John 15. What, what does it mean to abide in Christ? Make our home, make our dwelling place in our relationship with Jesus. And so if we are, if we are spending time in prayer and the Word, then, then, the, then the next step of being a Jesus follower is to be seeking. We are seeking. And so uh, we need to seek out. Well, who do we seek? Human beings. We're seeking out human beings. And they will always, throughout all of human history fall into one of two camps. Either they're lost or they're saved. And so, if they're lost, we need to evangelize them. And we're going, we're going to lean into evangelism this evening and next Wednesday. But I want to outline a couple of evan uh, evangelistic tools here. But we, we evangelize the lost and we enlist the saved. And let's, let's be... Let's be quick to acknowledge the fact that there are, there are other folks around us who may claim to be Christians, who may claim to be believers, but have absolutely nothing uh, with regard to knowledge of this biblical concept of discipleship. And so, so we, we may need to treat them like an unbeliever and remind them of the, the, the milk of God's Word. So what we do, we abide, we seek, we apply the Word of God. We want to, we want to apply personally, we want to apply with others that we're reaching. 
And we want to dwell in God's Word. So we go from milk to meat. Solid food. That's not my analogy. That's the Apostle Paul's analogy and Simon Peter's analogy. We see in multiple places across the New Testament the, the, the need from going as spiritual babes drinking milk to eating solid food as spiritual, a sign of spiritual maturity. But just because you're a steak eater doesn't mean you don't drink milk anymore. Even as adults who eat steak. And when I have gout, I can't eat red meat. So when I get to have a Whopper or a filet, it's a real treat. Because I can only do it like once every couple months. But even if you're a steak eater, you still pour milk in your cereal. We're still drinking milk. We're not, we're not finished with milk. We still need the essential truths of our faith to be reminded in our lives of the, of the basics of the tenets of our faith. But we're also spending time in the, in the deep sections of God's Word as well. Milk and meat. We want to have an ingestion of milk and meat as Jesus' followers. And we need to be teaching the, the, the milk and the meat to others that we are evangelizing and enlisting. Now, as we are applying God's Word... We, we are leaning into our spiritual gifts. And there are lots of different spiritual gifts, but I, I put them into one of five buckets. And there's some overlap, of course. But I put them into one of five buckets. The apostolic gifts, the prophetic gifts, the evangelistic gifts, the shepherding gifts, and the teaching gifts. My lovely little acronym is APEST. And the, the shepherds and teachers help the church grow deep. The, the apostles, prophets, and evangelists help the church grow wide or broad or out or whichever word you want to use. And so we, we see the, the, the use of giftedness within the church. And God has equipped our church in a number of different ways. Uh, Missy Moore loves to tell me that our church's greatest resource is human capital. That our greatest gift as a church is the people in the pews. And so we have lots of giftedness across our church family. And we have folks that want to be apostles. They want to they take new ground. They want to go into uncharted waters. We have folks that are naturally prophetic in the way that they minister. Let's, let's, let's be reminded of what the Word of God has to say. Repent and turn back. And let's remain grounded in God's Word. We have folks that are naturally evangelistic in their giftedness. Uh, some of you might think off the top of your head, Donna Craig has never met a stranger. She, will, she can build bridges with anybody and everybody. We have folks across our church family that have the evangelistic gifts that are, are able to make connections quickly and easily. Bridge builders, if you will. And then, of course, we have, we have shepherds, those who, those who keep everybody together. Those who keep everybody, that's, a, that's a great gift. And then, and then the teaching gifts. And I'm not just talking about people who teach Sunday school classes, like in a formal setting, but folks who are naturally teachers. Think of, think of an, an, an old man who's been farming for many years. And, and he, uh, he comes alongside a younger man and teaches him how to do it. It doesn't have to be somebody that stands behind a podium. It can be somebody who's naturally teaching those that come along behind them. So the, the, the giftedness within the church, we, we, we want to strive to identify our gifts individually so that we can put them into practice in kingdom service. And so as, as we apply God's word and put it into practice, then... Well, let's back up. Before we get to the end, let's, let's, uh, let's draw our lovely footprints. Uh, I'm, I've, I've gotten really good at drawing footprints. I especially like when there's a little bit of tar on the heel. But uh, our footprint represents the mission. We must be doing what God has called us to do. Matthew chapter 28 at the very end gives us the Great Commission. We must be doing what God has called us to do. He has called us to make disciples. That's the verb of command in the Great Commission. And there's three adjectives that describe the way we make disciples. We do so by baptizing. We do so by teaching. We do so by going. Those are the three words that describe the way in which we make disciples. So the mission, the mission must undergird everything that we are doing. We must be doing what God has called us to do. And we must also be seeing, that's my beautiful eye up here, we must be seeing 
what God would have us to see. And we spent the better part of three Wednesday evenings looking at passages from Genesis all the way through Revelation, unpacking the vision of salvation for the ends of the earth that that God has laid out in His Word. And so from from Genesis chapter 3, there was, a, there was a promise of redemption from sin. And as we walk through the Old Testament, we see that God ordains a people. But God wants salvation to be for all the peoples. And even, even, in, in, even in his conversations with Abraham, God is saying, I will bless all the nations through you. And we see from, from, from the anointing of King David and the, and the promise that, that the Messiah would reign on this particular throne one day, all the way through the, the, the teachings of the prophets, that all the nations will be, uh, will be blessed by God. And so we, we see that God chooses a people, the Israelites, to bring forth the Messiah so that this redemptive process will come to fruition for all the people. So we must have an ends-of-the-earth vision that God has for us in His Word. And if we have that ends-of-the-earth vision of all the nations... Uh, every uh, Revelation 5, every nation, tribe, people, and language gathered around the throne of God. If we have an all the nations vision that God would have us to have, it is assumed, it is assumed that we are making disciples in our own backyard first. So if we, if we adopt a people group in some faraway land, or if we have some, some mission partnership in another part of the United States, it is assumed that we are doing these things in our own backyard first. So we must be reaching our neighbors here in Walnut Cove first because that is the beginning of that ends of the earth mindset. So the the mission of what undergirds uh, all that we're doing here. And then, of course, we want to see what God would have us to see. That's the vision piece of this puzzle. And so the the P, ASAP, A-S-A-P, the P is planting. And this applies at multiple levels. We can can be planting churches. We can be planting small groups. We can be planting groups of two or three that are studying God's Word together. Or we we are planting seeds individually. So this this can be churches or individuals or any combination thereof. And so we see this growth mindset. And I love my little, I love my little spider graph because it's, Things, things can get out of hand real quick. If, even if just two are, 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 are being multiplied, things can grow exponentially. That's the word I was looking for, exponentially. Uh, and so that's the kind of growth that we see in Acts chapters 2 and 3, is that planting, that multiplication uh, of the New Testament. So this, this Jesus follower, this abide, seek, apply, and plant Uh, mindset is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we must be living out a lifestyle of being disciples who make disciples. And and I want to remind you very quickly, uh, if you've got uh, one of those things where my my beautiful artwork is on display, it's right underneath the arrow. And it's a a second graph. uh, And it's the why. We unpacked last Wednesday evening a, a, a descriptor of why we do this. This is AJ. Well, my marker's coming and going. This is AJ. He's a Jesus follower. But as 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, Jesus took my sin to the cross. And so it is my sin that was carried to the cross on Calvary. And in its place, he gives me credit with the righteousness of Jesus. That is un... I'm pretty sure I misspelled that. But righteous, however you spell it. I missed something. I think I missed something. But the fact that my sin has been taken to the cross and he gives us the righteousness of Jesus in its place is unbelievable. That, that, should, that should never get old to us. That should never be boring. That truth should dumbfound us each and every day. Uh, Paul writes to the Romans that we have been credited with the righteousness of Jesus. That is unbelievable. And because of that, because of that, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5 that we are a new creation. This is my shiny 
representation, of being a new creation. And because He has made us a new creation, He's taken our sin to the cross, He's given us His righteousness in its place, so He, he commissions us as ambassadors, and He commissions us as ministers of reconciliation. Where? Man, my blue, my blue pen is, is, is dying. This makes me sad. I'm going to have to settle for black. And we see, this is just my very crude drawing of a globe. He sends us into the world as ministers of reconciliation and as ambassadors for Christ. That is straight out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so this, this is a beautiful reminder of the truth that He has sent us into the world with a message worth proclaiming. It is up to us to be faithful to proclaim it as He has told us to do. So, that leads me to the third little graphic that we looked at last... Oh my goodness, it ain't even... Whatever. I got an extra board. That's why I just stole all the whiteboards around the whole church building. But, um, my third graphic is what I gave you last Wednesday for homework. Some of you did it. Maybe some of you have not. But I want you to think about it even here in here this evening. Think about your personal testimony. And I, I tried to simplify it by breaking it into five columns. Five columns represent our personal testimony. And so if you've got one of these sheets of paper that have the, that have the Jeff and Jennifer thing on the top, and the little why we do this in 2 Corinthians 5 on the bottom, the, 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 the columns are here on the back side. But, but there's, there's five columns in this, in this six-phrase testimony. It could be a, a single word. Some, some folks call it a six-word testimony. Mine is not necessarily individual words. But, but there's, there's five columns, and it's a very simple kind of cookie-cutter formula for how to tell our testimony. And it's, it's made to be distilled down into a, into a 30 or so second testimony as a, as a launch point. It's not, the full, it's not our full testimony. Some of us could stand behind the pulpit for two hours and talk about all the great things God has done in our life. And, 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 and we should. But it's, it's, a, it's, it's distilled down as a, as a diving board into a conversation about spiritual things. Next Wednesday evening, we're going to look at some very, a very practical evangelism tool and, and I, want us to, I want us to equip ourselves and empower ourselves to have these potentially awkward conversations. And we must pray, uh, those of you that were here two Wednesday evenings ago, I think, we looked at this, that spider graph on the planting end, and, and I, I told you to name three people that are in your orbit. Name three people that are near to you and far from the Lord. And... and who are they? are they? Are they people that you're related to? Are they people that you work with? Are they, are they people that uh, live near you? Like literally next door neighbors? Whoever they are, three, three people that are near to you and far from the Lord. And, and it may be awkward conversation. It may be a, a potentially nerve-wracking thing. But pray that God gives you opportunities to have conversations about spiritual things. And if, if we are willing to be courageous, if we are willing to step out on faith... And have those conversations. Who knows what God might do in the lives of those around us. So one of the ways that we can begin a conversation about spiritual things is this six-word testimony. So it begins the same way. It begins with a very simple expression. There was a time in my life. I'm just going to draw a little clock. There was a time in my life. And then there's two words or phrases to describe your life before you got saved. Some of you may remember that, that my, my two words, one is disobedient, one is selfish. Selfish still pretty much applies. But disobedient and selfish are the two words that I just use to describe my life before I got saved. And then the middle column is two words or phrases to describe your encounter with the Lord. What, what, how... When, how did you get saved? What, what does that look like? Um, and some of you may remember from last week, my, my first uh, phrase is Savior and Lord. Or sometimes I just put Savior slash Lord. 
because my testimony is one of kind of progressive revelation. I was, when I was a little kid, like seven, I knew then what it meant for Jesus to be the Savior of my life. He was my life raft. He was my ticket out of hell. Like I knew that pretty well as a seven-year-old. But it wasn't until I was a sophomore in high school what I, when, I, when I really understood what it meant for Jesus to be the Lord of my life each and every day. And so some of you have heard me tell this. Was, was I saved when I was seven or was I saved when I was 13? I don't know for certain when, but I know I'm saved today. And that's what matters. And so, uh, so for, for, for Jesus to be my Savior and my Lord, that was kind of a two-step process for me. And that, I know that I'm not the only one in our church that has a testimony like that. But Savior and Lord is the first part of my testimony. And the second uh, of, of how I got saved is really about Jesus' mercy. Because I was always a pretty good kid. I have a, I have a relatively boring testimony. I, wasn't, I didn't have to have a Damascus Road experience. I wasn't lying in a, in a crack house somewhere before God got a hold of me. I have a relatively boring testimony, and it's one of God's grace. Because I had godly mom and dad. I was raised in church, and I didn't have to be saved in some dramatic, uh, profound way on the Damascus Road. I wasn't literally running away from God when he got a hold of me. But it was, it was a salvation where I understood what it meant for Jesus to have mercy in my life. I'm not going to heaven because I'm good. I'm not going to heaven because I'm the golden child. And I am. I am. I'm so much better than my brother. It's not even funny. But I'm not going to heaven because I'm the good kid. I'm not going to heaven because of my own good works. I'm going to heaven because of the mercy of Jesus manifest in my life. And so mercy is my second word down here. And then we want to take an opportunity to have two words or phrases that describe our life since encountering the Lord. And, 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 and just very simply, how has a change been manifest in your life since Jesus got a hold of you? And so let me, let me caution you in two ways. One... There should be a change. There should be evidence of fruit in your life. Something is not what it used to be. And so I, I'm, I'm striving to walk in a life of obedience versus disobedience. And I, I try to tie these two words back to these two words. I strive to walk in a life of, of obedience rather than disobedience. Because my life before was a life of disobedience. And then my second, and I usually end it this way, uh, my second word down here is I'm slightly less selfish than I used to be. It's funny. People usually like to talk about that one pretty quickly. But it is, a, it is a, yet another evidence to the fact that I'm not perfect. God ain't through with me yet. I'm a work in progress. I'm less selfish than I used to be, but I'm still kind of selfish. And so if we, if we make our testimony too perfect, like, well, I had all these problems, and now I don't have any. And now my life's perfect, and Jesus is great. And so there are a lot of folks that have this very, very superficial testimony where everything's perfect in their life and God solved all of their problems and it's great. And don't you want your life to be perfect too? Well, that's a very rosy picture. And, and for us as believers, it's not always that way. Are you, I don't know if anybody in here that's perfect. If, you, if you're perfect and you want to put your hand up, that's great, but I wouldn't. Because all of us are still sinners and all of us still need the grace of Jesus in our life. And so, and so uh, describe your life in, in two words or phrases, after encountering the Lord. How have things gone for you since encountering the Lord? And then, and then we end with a question. Do you have a story like that? Uh, one of the things that I have come to hate strongly uh, in, in, in t conversations about evangelism is for, for, for generations we talked about a gospel presentation. May our relationship with the Lord Jesus never be seen as a sales pitch. We have a relationship with God, and it's not a presentation. We're not selling Amway. We want to have gospel conversations. We want to tell our story. We want to hear the stories of other people. We want to get to know one another on a personal level. And we want to exchange in a dialogue and a relationship. And I've had a lot of gospel conversations with people that are profoundly lost. And they didn't get saved as a result of the conversation. But we had a very deep conversation where they, they hear the truths of God's word. And, and, 
God was able to, to sow seeds during that conversation. And I may never see the harvest from those seeds, but somebody decades from now may. And so, so, so it's not a sales pitch. It's not a presentation. It's a conversation. We want to be good listeners. We want to hear the stories of others, and we want to share with joy our story of what God has done in our life. And so this little testimony template is a great diving board. It's a great, it's a great launch point into a conversation about much deeper things. And so the, the, top, the top of this column thing can be, uh, can be, can be pictured uh, using, using little graphics. I like the little, the little three-dot ellipsis. There was, a, there was a time in my life, dot, dot, dot. It's just kind of a way to segue into it. And then we have the before, and then we have our encounter with Christ, and then we have the after, and then we have a question, because we want this conversation to go back and forth. And so, um, do, you, do you have a story like that? That's a great way to, to, to ask the question. So, as you, as you uh, think about this, this six-word or six-phrase testimony, think about Two things to describe your life before Jesus. Two things to describe the how of, of your salvation. And then, and then two things to describe your life since or after you got saved. So, um, not, that, not that I'm going to expect anybody to speak out loud. Does anybody have a, a, a phrase or an adjective to describe their life before Christ? Crickets. Awesome. My, word, my two words are this. My two words are disobedient and selfish. Pretty clean cut. Disobedient and selfish. Does anybody else have a word that would describe their life before Jesus? And don't, don't give me seminary words. Don't give me, don't give me theological words. As, assume I'm lost. Assume I don't know the Bible at all. What, what are some simple words that can describe our life before Jesus? Ignorant. Ignorant. That's a great word. Ignorant. Uh, I talked to somebody a couple weeks ago. They said hopeless. We live in a world full of hopeless people. And if there's, a, if there's a way that we can build a bridge with somebody else that's hopeless, what a great, what a great word to describe their life before Christ. Hopeless. Uh, uh, what? Reckless. Reckless is good. That's a great word. To describe our life before Christ. Anybody else got a great word? Searching. searching? If you don't know what you're searching. There you go. Searching. Um, uh, well, that's, I'm not going to chase the rabbit. I'm going to stop myself from chasing the rabbit. That's really good. I'm proud of myself right now. Searching. That's a great word. Who else has a word to describe their life? Alone. Alone. A good word. Alone. We, we, we live in a world of loneliness. Uh, in fact, I, I read an article, some pinhead in the Wall Street Journal or something, uh, about a month ago that talks about the, the epidemic of loneliness. Since, since the coronavirus swept across the globe, the, the, the next epidemic that followed was an epide epidemic of loneliness. We're, we're shut in. We're isolated. All we've got is a screen. What are the, what's the quality of relationship through a screen, really? So we have an epidemic of loneliness. That's something that, that folks can relate to quickly. People can, people can empathize with that. That's good. Well, think about this. I, I mean, I hope, I hope maybe you've, some of you wrote these words down last week, since last Wednesday. Some of you are continuing to think about it. Think about it. Think about what describes your life before you met the Lord Jesus. Mine is, so, man, I cannot, words cannot begin to describe just how selfish I am. I have, to, I have to do battle with pride on a daily basis because I genuinely think I'm the smartest guy in every room. And that, that is not a good look for me. Not a good look. Some of you are going, I wish he would just shut up. But anyway, uh, how? Look at the how. How did Jesus get a hold of you? Some of you have a testimony very much like mine. I, 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 love, I like to use, I literally write down Savior slash Lord because that, that takes a minute to tease out and explain. 
But, but that's, that's the case with, with several in our church family. I know that. I've had conversations in the past couple of months about that fact with, with several folks in our church family. Who else has a, a word or phrase to describe how Jesus got a hold of you? Come on, give me something. Don't everybody talk at the same time. It's good. How about, how about experiencing His mercy? That's mine. Experiencing His grace. Uh, you know, we, if, if we were hopeless, Jesus gave us hope. You know? Jesus got a hold of our lives. Maybe, maybe, maybe you have a testimony where, where you, you have a very clear conversion experience. Maybe, maybe you walked the aisle at a camp meeting and there was a, there was a revival service and you had a very, you had a very profound come to Jesus experience in your life. For many, it took, it, maybe it took longer. Maybe it was more of a gradual process of, of God revealing himself in your heart. But write, well, write down, how, how did you experience Jesus' love in your life? How did he get a hold of your heart? And, and, and think about the words or phrases that might describe that. And then, and then how, how, how is your life different? How is your life different? Not that you're perfect, but you have hope. The hopeless have hope. There's a change. The the lonely have a friend in Jesus. That's a comfort. There's a change. Any other, any other words or phrases? How, how, how do, how do y'all describe your lives since you've met the Lord Jesus? Peace. Did you say peace? Okay. Peace. Great word. Great word. My, one, of the, one of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible is from Philippians, where Paul says a peace that surpasses all understanding. Man, there is not a better feeling in the world than that right there. When you think about the peace that God brings into your life, what a joy. Well, joy, that's a good one too. <laughs> what's, another, what's another word to describe your life since you encountered the Lord Jesus? Fulfillment? Fulfillment's good. Capable of love. We, we, we have a new understanding of what love is. Because of our relationship with the Lord. That's a great, that's a great phrase. Yeah. We, we, we live in a world that talks about love a lot. But it, it is not the love that the Bible defines. It is not the love of God. It is not that agape love from God to us that, that the Bible talks about. And for us, to, for us to speak with clarity about what biblical love really is into the, into the world is a great thing. A great thing. We're capable of love because we've encountered the Lord. That's a great thing. Anybody else have a great uh, word? Or maybe a not so great word. Mine is slightly less selfish than it used to be. Worthy. Worthy. Oh, man. See, these words, these words in and, in and of themselves can be a launch point into a, a much deeper, larger conversation. Worthy. What does that mean? If I'm hearing this, if, if somebody is asking me the question, do you have a story like that? M- well, maybe. Let's, I, don't know, I don't know what worthy means, though. There, okay, the door has been thrown open. Now we can have a conversation. And so as we, as we think about this tool, it is simply a diving board into a much larger conversation. And so uh, here's, and here's the beautiful thing. Here, I mentioned this last week, but I'm going to mention it again. Here's the beautiful thing about the six-word testimony. We're not the good guys. Jesus is the good guy. Some of you have probably had experiences like I have had. And you go and there's thousands of people in a coliseum. And some, it's, I don't know why, it's always an athlete. It's always an athlete that has a really great testimony of how he or she came to the Lord. And, and it's, a, it's a wonderful testimony. I was doing this and this and this and this and this and all these things. And there was you know sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And this was my life before I met the Lord, and here's my life now, and everything's perfect since then. And at the, I mean, you hear a 30-minute testimony, and at the end of the day, you're going, was Jesus really even part of that? I, I don't know. But, but, but we, have to, we have to be very careful because our tendency, our tendency when we give a testimony is to make it all about us. And that's a dangerous thing because 
and I, and I, I use this expression, especially with the young people, when, they, when they're in like, like junior high English class and they talk about stories and narratives and how to analyze literature and everything else, one of the words that they use is protagonist. Who is the protagonist in the story? Who's the good guy? Batman's always the protagonist in my story. I love Batman. Who's the protagonist in our life's story? And if, if the story is all about us, then it's not really a testimony. If the, the protagonist in our story should be Jesus. And if, and if our testimony highlights the fact that he is the good guy, he, he has changed us from the inside out, then it's a testimony of faith. Then it's a testimony about a relationship with God. And so one of the things that this does is it forces us to not make ourselves the protagonist of our own story. Even though we're the main character, it's always Jesus that's the good guy. It's always Jesus that's the protagonist in the story. So, um, here's your homework. I gave it to you last week. I'm going to give it to you again. Think about this. What are your six words? Write them down. You got a little sheet. You got a whole sheet of paper right there. Write them down. You got, you got the six blanks right there. I even numbered them. I even numbered the blanks. You're welcome. I struggle counting. Even I can count to six. It's good. So six words or phrases uh, to describe your testimony. And here's, your, here's the second piece of your homework. This was optional last week. It's mandatory this week. Tell your story to someone. Tell your testimony to someone. It can be a spouse. It can be somebody else in the pew with you tonight. Tell your story to someone. And just, and just, just, I know, it's awkward. Hey, I, I went to Bible study last night, and I got homework. And would you please be my partner and listen to this awkward story? It's fine. But, but tell your story to somebody. Uh, and, just, and just think about what the conversations that could ensue would be. Uh, and, and talk about it. Let, let somebody go, well, I don't know if that's the best word or not. Let's, I mean, be open to criticism. Uh, and, and have that conversation about spiritual things because nine times out of ten, it is a diving board into a much lengthier conversation. And so there was a time in my life when I was, I was sinful, I was, I, was, I was disobedient and extremely selfish. And I was, I was raised in church, and, and I, and I kind of knew as a kid what it meant for Jesus to be my Savior, but it wasn't until I was a sophomore in high school that I really understood what it meant for Jesus to be the Lord of my life. And, and, and I was a pretty good kid, uh, but, but then I learned in high school that it was, I was not going to heaven because of my good works. If I'm going to heaven, it's because of the mercy of Jesus. And since that time, since I've encountered the Lord, I want to be an agent of that mercy. I want to, I want to show that mercy for others to see. I want to be obedient to God's word. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, and, and I'm not perfect I'm slightly less selfish than I used to be, but God has made a change in my life. Do you have a story like that? See, it's, it can be 60 seconds, uh, but, but it's, a great, it's a great diving board point into a much lengthier conversation. Next week, we're going to look at another great tool uh, of, of evangelism. It's called the three circles. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to very, I'm going to very, I'm just going to, I'm just going to draw it and then, and then leave you hanging. But the three circles, oh no, I think I've marked on all my boards uh-oh, i got to clear this off. Here we go. Um, the three circles tool is another great tool of evangelism. And it is a beautiful uh, picture. And, and, and my favorite reason is in this, well, depending on how you define it, it's either the first circle or the second circle. But I always want to get the blue pen. I think that's the one that's messed up. I'm going to draw basically a circle that's broken. And this represents the fact that we live in a broken world. And it seems to me that this is the most quickly uh, acknowledged truth with anybody in the world today. If, if, you, if you tell somebody that, that is anti-Christian... Man, we really live in a broken world, don't we? Everybody agrees with that. I've, had, I've never had anybody go, no, I think the world's great. I've never had anybody say that. If we, if we declare, and the, and the Word of God declares that we live in a broken world, 
folks are quick to agree with that truth. We live in a world of brokenness. We live in a world of broken people. We live in a world of broken systems. We live in a broken world. But it wasn't always supposed to be that way. God made a world with love and peace. And I always just draw a big heart in the middle. God made a world of peace and love. Flower children. It it appeals to the hippies. It's great. Uh, Peace and love. But it is sin. That's, That's why our world is broken. It is sin. That's why our world is broken. And and we, we, we try to escape the brokenness of the world. Some folks, some folks try to escape with drugs or alcohol, substance abuse. Some folks try to escape the brokenness in their life with, with a relationship with someone else. Maybe it's a romantic relationship. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's, maybe it's idolizing some famous person. They try to escape the brokenness of the world with, with a relationship or with substances. Or maybe they... Maybe they try to, you know, meditate their way into nirvana. They try to escape the brokenness of the world. And, and these, these forms of escape never get the job done. And there's only one way to experience a peace in the midst of the brokenness, and that is the gospel. And I, uh, I usually symbolize the gospel with an arrow down. Because Jesus came to earth. And then he lived a sinless life. And he died upon the cross paying for our sin. And he gives us eternal life in the place of our sin. But but he didn't just die on the cross. He rose again the third day. Arrow down, cross in the middle, arrow up. He, He resurrected and came back to life. Overcoming sin and death. Once and for all. And, and he ascended into heaven. Outside the world. Makes sense? He ascended into heaven. And the Bible teaches us that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that's my pitiful attempt at drawing a crown. But Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so... When we, when, we find, when we find our hope in this broken world, in our relationship with Jesus, and when we find our, ourself in the truth of the gospel, then he allows us, then he allows us to experience the peace and love that he originally designed the world to experience. And so we, we might call this redemption, or restoration. There's several different theological words we could put there. But one of the things we have to make clear, if we're, if we're telling this as a story, we have, to, we have to make clear that this arrow, this arrow represents repentance. And, we have to re- and it has to represent acceptance. We have to accept what God's word has to say about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. We have to repent of our sin and acknowledge him as our Savior and Lord. And when we do, when we do, we experience that reconciliation that Jesus has designed for us to experience. And that is what that is what the 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 Garden of Eden was supposed to be. That is what Adam and Eve experienced walking with God in the cool of the day. And so, and so. We see that, that sin is the reason that the world is broken. And, and everybody, everybody will, will usually acknowledge that pretty quickly, that the world is broken. They may or may not acknowledge, they may or may not acknowledge that we are sinful people. That's, that's a lengthier conversation. And then there's the gospel involving repentance and accepting Jesus as our Savior and Lord. And that's where a lot of folks go, no, nah, this ain't for me. But... It's a great tool to explain the truths of God's Word. And so the, the three circles, we're going we're to look at that uh, in depth more next Wednesday evening. It's another great evangelistic tool uh, that will help us to have conversations about spiritual things. Because, because, hmm, 
If we're going to be the Jesus followers he's called us to be, we must be seeking others to join us in this effort. If we're going to be disciples who make disciples, and God's called us to do that, then we should be seeking others. And so this, this evangelize and enlist box over here, my hope is in the weeks ahead, between now and July, the hope is for us to, to, to unpack some of the tools in this toolbox. The six-word testimony is one of those evangelistic tools. The three circles tool is one of those evangelistic tools and because we, we want to be equipped and enabled to have these gospel conversations, conversations about spiritual things. That way we are more, we are more capable and ready to share our faith with those that happen to open the door and give us an opportunity. So uh, as, we, as we continue to think through what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus, what does it mean to be a disciple who makes disciples, Let's pray for those three people in our orbit. Three people that are near to us and far from God. And let's pray that God will give us an opportunity to have these conversations. And God may not, for six months or six years, give us opportunities with certain individuals in our orbit. But once the door is open and we can have a conversation, we want to be ready to have those conversations and equipped to do so. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for Jesus who died for us. Oh God, we thank you for taking our sin to Calvary's cross and crediting us with the righteousness of Jesus. Oh God, you have called us to be, to be ministers of reconciliation. You've called us to be ambassadors for Christ in a lost and dying world. Lord, you have given us a commission. You've given us a job to do. May we be faithful to do it. May we be obedient. May we be the believers you've called us to be. God, I pray that as we, as we abide in your word, as we study it, as we spend time in prayer and relationship with you, as you impress upon us the vision of what you would have us to see, God, I pray that you would open our eyes to the brokenness of the world around us. Make us more aware of the fact that we we, we live shoulder to shoulder with neighbors each and every day that are lost and headed to hell, going to pay for their own sin. And God, I pray that you would break our hearts and, and burden us over the lostness of others. And God, I pray that we would commit ourselves as a church corporately and as individuals. We would commit ourselves to being disciples who make disciples. And God, we ask that you, you, you equip us and enable us so that we might have conversations about spiritual things. And they may be awkward, and we, 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 we may not have all the answers according to the Bible, and that's okay. God, I pray that you would break our hearts for our, our friends that are lost, and that you would give us opportunities to have these conversations about spiritual things. Help us to love our neighbors well. Help us to bless our neighbors. May this community be a better place because we are a part of it. And God, as we bless those around us, and as we serve our neighbors well, I pray that you give us, you give us the, the chance to give, to give men and women and children opportunities to, to see and to hear and to respond to the great good news of salvation. And may we be the agents of grace that you've called us to be. Lord, Lord you have called all of us to be ministers and missionaries. And as we gather together as a church... We want, to, we want to worship you. We want to equip ourselves. We want to study your word. We want to learn it and know it so that when the church leaves the building and enters into a mission field, we are the ministers and missionaries you've called us to be. Father, we have a message worth proclaiming. May we be faithful to proclaim it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week.